Hello, welcome back to the Axiom and Zinger Show, episode number 111. One, 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 one. With me, your host, Agostino. What's going on? What's happening? What's really good? What's crackling? I be in the hood, still hustling, and all that rela malarkey. Um, yeah, man, how are you doing? You all right? You fine? I'm doing amazing. As you can tell, it's Friday afternoon. The sun is shining through the window of my living room, and I'm feeling great and alive and ready to be back on the old you, the, you of the tube, the old podcast application, and whatever streaming device you're using to listen to this glorious podcast on this wonderful day. Welcome back, motherfuckers. Welcome back, motherfuckers. Hope you're doing well, motherfuckers. Yeah, I'm doing good, as you can tell. I'm well-rested, well-hydrated, and just um very limber right my, my limbs are nice and limber um i have a good range of motion this morning um i went through some mobility exercises which really helped and i'm feeling good you know sober october is kicking off third day of sober october i'm feeling fucking good i'm feeling powerful feeling ready to rock um it's weird right the sober october thing it's like a challenge that started up with joe rogan and a few of these other podcast buddies like bert kreischer tom segura ari shafir right they started off this little so about October thing because Bert is, you know, a comedian who likes to take his top off and is extremely drunk and extremely fat. So they wanted to make sure that he was, you know, able to um hang around for a bit longer with his friends and also his family. So they decided to have a big public intervention on the podcast and tell him to quit the drinking. And in an effort to quit the drinking because they're friends, they decided to make it a challenge and all chipping together, hence the term sober October. So now we're in the second year of Sober October, and whenever it comes around, the funny thing about it is that it's never the right time. Like, whenever it comes around, you always have that little voice in your head that's like, oh, yeah, you remember you got this thing happening, that thing happening, the other thing happening. There's always these weird social, social engagements that suddenly pop up when you decide to take a month of drinking. Now, I'm not sure if the social engagements are uh, magnified or highlighted or... Um, you notice them more because you're going to abstain from the alcoholic, alcoholic substances that are going to be available at said engagement. But it seems as if whenever they do come around, whenever that month comes around, whenever you decide to take the time off to stop drinking or stop whatever it is that you're going to do, suddenly uh, things change. And all of a sudden you start to worry about what you're going to do when you go out. It's strange isn't it, how the human mind works that way. I guess it's maybe, I guess maybe that comes from the um, uh, self-preservation side of things, right? Um, you don't want to put your body through too much pain and suffering. Um, biologically, maybe that's where we're, we're at that point, right? You don't really want to stretch yourself too thin unnecessarily because Sober October is a voluntary thing that you're doing. It's not something that you're doing because of a doctor because um, you went up for a check. You went in for a checkup and a doctor told you you've got, you know, your liver is fucking shot and you need to lay off the drinks so or you're going to die tomorrow. It's not something like that. It's not like a medical in- intervention. You saw like off your own, you know, um, off, off your own strength because you want to do it yourself you decide to take some time off drinking and suddenly your your mind tells you oh my god you got all these things you've got to do what are you going to do what are you going to do and that happened to me the other day um, I guess I have more of a legitimate excuse in that regard not an excuse or a legitimate reason to kind of worry slightly uh, but then I also have a good um, reference point that tells me that I'm going to be okay um, one of my things that tells me I'm going to be okay is that I was able to do you know I was able to be sober for the best part or for the whole of January when I went to Berlin during kind of like fashion week trade week sort of like um sort of like trade show month sort of thing in January when I was working for my previous company so I did that with ease I went to parties I went out you know I wasn't a bore and stayed in my hotel room I actually went out and socialized and I, I was able to do it very very easily um being sober so i know i can do that i've done it plenty of times in london even before going out and seeing particular djs play like i would go and say dj play like a gig when you go see like a band play i'll just go see them play for the hour or two they're there and just go home so i've done that before i know i don't necessarily need a drink in order to have fun but i was discussing this the other day with the brunette the drink thing the being sober in the bar thing is um the reason why i think sometimes it can be difficult for some people it's less about the actual drink itself and more so about the people around you and how it feels to be in a bar when you're sober. Because I'm sure some of you have been in a, have met friends up, you know, um, in a bar when they've started drinking and you just arrived and you haven't started drinking. And you always feel a bit like out of sync. You feel a bit twitchy. Um, 
you're, you're kind of turning your head, you head turning your head left, right, um, like a fucking meerkat, right? Or uh, like one of those pigeons, like, you know what I mean? You're like, everything is, is grabbing your attention. You can't like sit still and just focus on the conversation around you or even um, adapt to what everyone's saying. You kind of, you're always asking questions about what's happening in the conversation. You can't just jump in. Um, you can't flow with what's happening. You're just a little bit, you're a little bit out of sync, right? So sometimes I feel as if a drink, even if you don't get drunk, just the fact that you have the drink in your hand is sort of like a placebo effect to your mind. It tells you, everything's going to be okay, motherfucker. Take it easy. You're going to be fine. And then over time, during the night, you start to acclimatize a bit better and you start to feel a bit more at ease. And then it comes to a point where you start to think, you know what? I'm actually not that bad. I don't need to have, I don't need to go that far. Um, but I think sometimes when you don't have that drink, you don't have that crux in your hand, it can be a bit difficult to do, which probably lends more weight to... Um, what Alcoholics Anonymous would say, right? When you go to the AA meeting, they always stress the importance of finding new friends or finding new social groups to hang out in and kind of av avoiding going to places where, you know, you are drinking and make your, making a fool of yourself because the whole idea, the whole premise behind it is that you can't sustain that for a long period of time. You could do that maybe one or two times, but to, to be the sober one in a group and to consistently go to a bar isn't necessarily a good idea and it isn't really conducive to probably a good mental health, Right. Um, or good state of mental health so i guess that's part of it but for me i have a quite a reasonable reservation behind it especially so october this month because i think i'm djing four times this month right that's a forced um a forced reason for me to be outside of the house um specifically in an environment where people are drinking to have fun and to dance so that's going to be difficult um then plus i have a, my kind of like quote unquote leaving party for the job that i'm leaving at the moment and going to another one so that's going to be another occasion where people are going to be anxious to get me drunk because you know they're going to feel like it's a good way to send me off into my next adventure um of servitude or whatever it may be called right whatever whatever you like to call it baby um so there's particular occasions in my life coming up in a moment that's going to make sober october very difficult but i love that because it's a bigger challenge and it makes the bigger the challenge the more reward I feel I'm going to glean from it. And on the DJing part of it, um, most older DJ, most people that have been like in the game for a while, people like Sven Var, uh, people like even if Seth Trucks are a good example, right? They're all kind of sober now, or for the most part, they probably just smoke weed, right? And But obviously, they've come from a very, you know, hectic past. They've come from doing everything under the sun. And then now, to sustain a career in electronic music or to sustain a career in entertainment, full stop, especially in when you're like, I don't know, 30 plus years, eight, years of age and you have um, different people depending on you, you have a whole infrastructure that surrounds you, you can't be a liability anymore. It's not funny anymore. It's not fun, right? People are counting and people have families off the back of your tours and the back of your appearances. So you can't fuck it up. There's a bit, lot more pressure on you. And in general, anyway, you can't do a good enough job being hungover or being high um, all the time. You just can't do a good job. It's just one of those kind of things. I think you can kind of get away with it a couple of times. I'm sure for those of you guys who have worked in retail, who have worked in service jobs, you know that you, you know, when you first started working in a restaurant or working in a retail or working in a bar, you know that you can get away with being hungover a few times here and there when you're young and you're fresh and you're earning money and you're, you know, you've got a good social group inside the workplace. People can kind of uh, blag for you or take over a shift or whatever it may be, right? You can do that. But as soon as you start creeping up in age, the, le the least likely your body is able to handle those kind of things. So you kind of have to stop or you have to make adjustments in your life to kind of, you know, make sure you don't do it as frequently. And imagine the same thing happened with the entertainment DJs or entertainment people in general. You can't sustain that for a long period of time. So that kind of sobriety is part and parcel of the next evolution of someone art another artist's life. Now, for me, someone that's like a bit of a novice and I'm a bit of an amateur and I've kind of started doing this a few years, it's, you know I mean, it's quite hard to do. And on top of that, I have a nine to five, which obviously makes it more doubly difficult because part of the whole reason that I DJ or makes it very enjoyable is the fact that I've got this little escape, this little um, this little moment of bliss where I can kind of go away somewhere into a venue, a bar, a club, wherever it may be, and play music for a prolonged period of time that has nothing to do with my 9 to 5. I can kind of um, hone my craft. Um, I know as cringe as that may sound. I can kind of um, enjoy, my ho enjoy my hobby out loud in front of other people. I can kind of pursue something that I want to do maybe um, professionally later on in life, right? As part of other things that I will end up doing. So it's a, it's a fun occasion. So because it's fun, it's also fun to have a drink and to kind of be like, oh my God, man, this has been amazing. Man. I've had a really tough week at work or even if you've not had a tough week at work, 
it's just been cool just to kind of like leave work early on a Friday and, and just pop off and go and, and go and DJ. So it'd be difficult to kind of do those things together. But like I said, the bigger the challenge, the bigger the reward. So I'm looking forward to doing Sober October this month. Um, I've, I'm planning to do five workouts. Of, uh, uh, no, I'm planning to do two workouts a day, which will consist of doing push-ups and sit-ups in the morning or in the evening, whatever it may be, and then a running or a CrossFit WOD exercise. So it'll be a two workout days for five days a week. And then that's going to be until the 31st of October. I'm specking it. It might carry on until... I want to put my board. It might carry on until the 2nd of November, which is a Saturday, maybe. But I'll see how I feel. But I'm probably going to do it until the 31st on the Halloween. Because I assume everyone's going to be doing some sort of party thing. And it'll be a bit more difficult to not do Sober October after that. But I'm still going to do it properly. And I'll still have my first drink um, first minute past midnight on that Wednesday on the 31st. So that's kind of the plan that I'm doing. I'm looking forward to it, man. It should be fucking good. It's always nice to do Sober October. Um, it's always good to kind of um, tell yourself or to kind of give yourself some, give yourself a pat on the back and let yourself know that you're not an alky. Um, even though I know I'm not one anyway, but it's good just to know from your own sort of like self-interest that you're not as fucked up as you thought you are. So yeah, Sober October is coming up very, very soon. I cannot wait for that to kick off. Or oh, we're actually in here, actually, a moment. And then yeah, next challenges will await. Um, anyway, let's get into it, topics and whatever, because we've got a lot to get through lot to get through on this little day let me check what i've got on my list ah number one amazon raises minimum wage amid criticism i'm sure you most of you are aware that um jeff bezos the founder of amazon is probably one of the most richest people in the world right so let me um, let me tap in his word net worth jeff bezos, bezos net worth jeff bezos at the moment is worth a whopping 161 billion us dollars right and um now, I don't have a, I don't give a fucking damn what anyone makes, what they earn, what they do with their money. I could give a flying fuck. When people search people's net worth, I always think it's a bit weird anyway. But if, if I was going to search for someone's net worth, I'd use it more as motivation as, as, as opposed to like a measuring stick to maybe say, oh, I'm not shit because I'm not as rich as Jeff Bezos or, oh, how come they, they get that much money? They don't do anything interesting. No, I use it as motivation because I think if that person, that person's a human being just like I am, you know, they have blood running through their veins just as I do. They shit and piss the same way I do. If they can do it, I can do it. Maybe not to the same level that he can do it, but I can do to some point portion of that if i can get 10 percent of his wealth five percent of his wealth or whatever it may be or i can learn something from his hard work or something from his i don't know entrepreneurial mind or something from his risk-taking attitude wherever it be so so be it i could apply the lessons to my life so I'm, i don't get that annoyed when people make big amounts of money but i guess in the press there was a lot of uh kickback about this because um there were loads of stories that Amazon workers, especially people that work in the warehouse fulfillment centers, were being paid shitty and the working conditions weren't that great. Now, I've got a bit of a counter argument. I've got a bit of a contrarian attitude to this, right? I'm a little bit on on the fence of the whole thing because I've, I've read the Jeff Bezos um, or kind of unofficial autobiography called The Everything Store. You should check it out. It's called The Everything Store. And that book is a really good um, autobiography or expose on Jeff Bezos and the kind of Amazon empire. Because what I like about it is that, you know, having worked for quite a few startups and having kind of been exposed to the whole startup world through interviews and podcasts and whatever it may be in articles, whatever. Um, I'm sure some of you are aware that the, pod, the kind of startup world or kind of market or landscape is full of so many chances it's full of so many amateur hour operations it's not even funny right um that's the whole kind of um allure of starting a quote-unquote startup right um is the fact that you can come into it with no experience and kind of figure it out on the go it's kind of the less serious version of a small business in that regard right because a small business will be somebody who kind of has experience uh, running a big, I don't know, uh, branch of a brand or leading a big sales team who then, who then figures out, you know what, I can take a branch of this business and start my own small business, right, in this sector. But startups are generally people that have no, no experience or no um, insights into how to run a business but have a kind of maybe like a cool idea or maybe have a, a, a cool problem that they want to solve, or, or sometimes a, solve, a problem that no one wants solving and they want to make a business around it, right? And sometimes you make the business just so you can make money. Sometimes you make the business for exposure. Sometimes you make the business to kind of showcase your talents or talents of the team. And sometimes you make the business just to, so it can be acquired by a bigger corporation later on down the line, right? You kind of start a business off 
in a really crowded in market but with a, a very precise niche knowing full well that you're not going to be able to expand or you're not going to be able to flesh it out um as big as you want but also you want to gain the attention of the big brands who are then going to kind of um suck you in to their kind of umbrella then you can kind of you know earn a big salary you can kind of get paid off well and then kind of run off into the sunset so there's loads of these different kind of motives that come into running business but usually most of it hasn't doesn't have to do with like making money and providing excellent service to your customers that comes kind of second but when you read the everything store um about um jeff bezos what you get to realize is that um jeff bezos really did start amazon wanting it to make money and also wanting it to provide an excellent service for its customers and for the most part we can all kind of agree regardless of their practices we can kind of agree that amazon does provide quite a great service and they also do make a ton of money um especially if you account for the amazon prime memberships that, that they people sign up for uh the fees people pay for amazon to sell an amazon platform um the stuff that they're doing with Amazon Video, like there's a lot of money coming in um, on, into Amazon and they provide a service with Amazon Prime that's probably second to none. I think of all the Amazon Prime orders I've had, I can probably count on one hand the amount of problems I've had at Amazon Prime, like stuff not turning up or stuff being put in places that they were, I wasn't told was going to be put up. Probably I can count it on one hand the amount of times I've had issues with them. So by and large, they run a really good service. But I think there's also a bit of naivete when it comes to the conditions of people working at Amazon. Because I think, you know, we should be, it should be no surprise that the conditions in the Amazon warehouse um, or the fulfillment centers are going to be a little bit dodgy. Considering that in some places, you've got some, depending on where you live, you can get an item delivered to your door in 24 hours, sometimes in 12 hour window. Um, there's now been a big push, I think in, uh, I think is yeah, there's now been a big push with some uh, retailers who are now pushing um, to see who's going to be the first a app or startup to kind of um, conquer the first mile, which was kind of uh, the whole idea behind it is to kind of get an item to the buyer within an hour of them ordering it. So they, that, that's kind of the next frontier because next day delivery is kind of being smashed. Same day delivery for the most part has kind of been figured out too. Some platform, some retailers such as Asos or whatever it may be, they have um they have sort of like a, a time frame that you can order the same day and get delivered the same day depending on your postcode. I know places like My Teresa and um Pret a what's it called? Pret a Porte, they have the same sort of thing, right? But they have their own kind of like quote unquote courier services. And now Amazon also uh, they introduce they're gonna be introducing their own delivery services too. So they're looking to kind of jump into the whole FedEx and DHL realm. So they're gonna be able to literally get things to your door much quicker because they have their own delivery cars or delivery services they're gonna be able to service around London or around major key cities around the world. Now, if you expected all of that to happen and for the people within Amazon warehouses to be sitting on beanbags and be playing foosball, right, and playing table tennis and eating sweets all the time, you are crazy. Some of the stories are a bit, are a bit nuts, right? They're a bit dystopian. They're, they're a bit like they come out of Black Mirror, right? Supposedly, people in the warehouses have to wear these wristbands and it kind of times how long you're at each station. So there's a, obviously, there's a, there's, a, there's a time frame that they think that you should be at each station from uh, picking and packing and stuff. And it vibrates when you're kind of like running out of time or when you're kind of running behind time. So there's that idea. And then there was a story, I think, that came out a few weeks ago of a certain individual, I think, in the U.S., who was working in Amazon warehouse? Um, I think this. I think this came about when the news broke that Jeff Bezos was one, like the, the first richest, the most rich person in the world, net worth kind of thing. And I think another story came out about this lady who supposedly works at Amazon warehouse and still has to claim food stamps or still has to work another job part time because it doesn't make enough money working in Amazon. And obviously, you know, um, you have to. You, it, it is a. It is a little bit fucked up that somebody that owns a company that is that that person that owns a company. That's being able to generate that much um, revenue, who's also being able to, you know, pocket that much of a salary, and who's kind of regarded as one of the wealthiest people. His people that work for him, some of them have to rely on food stamps. That's a bit fucked up. But in an effort to kind of change the current talk around Amazon, they decided to raise the minimum wage of everyone that works at Amazon, which I think is a quite a good step and something that shows that you know they're not as tone deaf, or they're not as um, they're not as cold-hearted or as callous as some people would like to believe. So I'll kind of read this article now and get up on the screen. I'll put this in the show notes as always so you can check out yourself. So this article's on BBC News. It says Amazon raises its wages amid criticism. 
Um, Amazon lo uh, lowest paid retail workers, US workers will receive fifteen pound an hour, fifteen dollars an hour. Sorry, in the UK the pay will rise from eight twenty an hour to in, in London to ten fifty, which is fucking awesome. Uh, while outside London the rate will rise from eight pound an hour to nine fifty an hour. The move comes after criticism of its employment practices, with complaints over its warehouse working conditions. Amazon has also been attacked by campaigners for how much tax it pays. Oh yeah, I remember that because that's like Starbucks, right? They have that little weird tax loophole where they're able to pay little, really little tax, which means you know they don't have to put out so much money but also their workers suffer because they don't get that much money either um the company is one of the biggest companies in the world with, 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 with that's worth one trillion dollars like insane that's what you have to get in your head imagine a guy a dude right just starting a company and it's now worth one trillion dollars it's insane right and this you know it's a cool it's a cool um site amazon but for the most part you know it's just selling stuff online it's nothing that crazy really you know um now obviously we you know with some of the Amazon electronic stuff that they're doing now with Amazon Homeware, they've got the whole like security system. They've got that smart plug they're releasing. They've got the micro that's the voice activated control. They've got all the Alexa stuff. Like it's obviously it's a little bit more futuristic, but for the most part, you know, you can get a charger next day and shit. You can get some. I don't know. It's not. It's not that crazy, right? But they're able to generate that much. They're able to. They're able to be worth that much money. Is insane. Um, the new pay rates start from on the on the first of November and will apply to all staff, full time and part time, as well as temporary and seasonal workers, which is fucking insane. Really, really cool. Credit to them. The move will benefit two hundred fifty thousand workers in the US and seventeen thousand in the UK and tens of thousands of seasonal workers. Tim Roach, the general secretary of the UK GMB Union, welcomed the announcement but said more needed to be done. Given their owner is the richest man in the world, you'd think he could fit. He could. He could. You feel you see fit to dig a little bit deeper, but this is a start. It's like. That's the, that's the issue. Though. Should your net worth really play into what people get paid? I say yeah in some respects, right? Because I'm the kind of guy, like, I think if I was, if I had a team around me and I was a performer or some shit, you know, people are like really weird with how they div divvy up money. I would divvy up, especially in the beginning of stuff, I'd divvy up the money equally. I think maybe the bigger we got, the more notoriety, um, hap the more notoriety came um, with the work that we we're producing, whether it was entertainment acts or whatever, or whatever we were doing, right? then maybe you'd kind of split the money according to the work people do, right? Or in a kind of, or in maybe in a tiered way. But for the most part, you'd want everyone to be paid, you know, generally within the same sort of bracket. Not the same, not equal. I don't believe in the whole equal thing because, you know, some people bring more to the table than others. And if Jeff Bezos is the one that created this amazing platform, people can buy stuff and get it sent to them the next day or the same day for some reason, then he should be um, compensated rightly so, isn't it? I don't think, you know, just because you're worth a lot of money, you should be paying people a lot of money too. That's ridiculous. Um, and what's a lot too? Yeah, we have to kind of um, figure out what a lot is. Um, to that, it's, what's a lot? Because what a lot, what's a lot to Jeff Bezos is not is what's different to what's a lot to the person that's working, right? And obviously, you know, just because it's Amazon doesn't mean that the warehouse worker and Amazon should be paid much more than any warehouse worker in that industry, right? Maybe there has to be some industry guidelines to be kind of looked at. I don't know, but I think if it was me personally, I would, I wouldn't want my the people that I work with to be working shitty conditions. I always believe that money is one of those weird things that once you get that out of the way, the work can get done really quickly. But people sometimes are really get, get really. Some people can get really shitty about money, and I always feel as if like if I hired my friends or if I had people working with me, I'd want the money. I'd want I'd want to pay you whatever you think you you're worth or whatever we could agree on, and then just quickly move on. I wouldn't want to start off by paying you shit and then have you kind of like, you know, having you not ask me for a raise and shit. No, no, no. I want us to kind of like sit down with adults and actually discuss, hey, what do you think you're worth? What do you think this, what do you think you could bring to the table? And then we kind of come to a mutual agreement and then we can kind of just get that out of the way and concentrate on the work. Because once the work is concentrated on, it's a lot. Because I'm sure we've all been there where you haven't been paid or the, your employer is fucking around with your money. It really, really, it shouldn't really, right? But it really does affect the way you work. It really does affect your attitude. It really affects everything. So I think that's one of the most important things that compels you to kind of get out of the way quickly. Um before things get out of control and you know it show, it's it basically shows amazon isn't it? they kind of they basically got publicly shamed into paying people more money which is pretty nuts um the union said amazon did not allow it to operate under its roof um of course they're not going to do that unions have um allowing union into into your working and into your workplace can be a little bit hard for an employer i understand that but having employers it would be amazing obviously if they're the union 
within Amazon. Um, if Amazon's really of serious about this, looking up this well, it workers, it must recognize trade unions. The today's announcement is only a start and shouldn't be spun as a huge act of generosity. Amazon said in a statement that the Amazon is separate to work. The facts clearly show allegations are to the contrary are simply wrong and misleading when attempting to portray Amazon as an unsafe workplace. They always have Jeff Bezos looking really grumpy and authoritarian in his pictures, isn't it? They just make him look at some like super evil dude. It's weird, isn't it? Whenever you do, maybe it's a scourge of capitalism, but it really does have a bad rap in it in the public. People don't really like people that make a lot of money. Really, deep down, they don't really like it, do they? They, I think there's a there's a portion of the public that think it's unfair, which is really weird to think think that, right? Because I guess if you think it's unfair, you probably ascribe to the whole white privilege sort of stuff, right? Right, privilege, right, privilege, or the whole privilege arguments, right? You you probably ascribe to the fact that you probably think deep down that no matter how hard you work, you're never gonna become as successful as person A, B, or C because of you know of where they come from, because of the color of their skin, because of their background, because of the advantage you're given at the start, which is quite dumb, really, because you don't get that. You don't get that in sports. You don't get athletics. It, it, just because somebody went to a really good school to play American football, it doesn't mean that you can't necessarily become pro. It might be harder for you, but it doesn't necessarily mean you cannot become pro. But that's what ha that's how some people think when it comes to um, capitalism, when it comes to uh, people making millions and billions and trillions of dollars when they start an, a, a company. They think as if, like, you know, this person is holding all the money and they should be more kind and give money out to people who need it most. Oh, uh, the people that are well off is that are not well off. It's like, eh, I'm not sure how smart it is to put ten grand in the lap of someone begging in the middle of Liverpool Street Station. I'm not sure how well, how well that's gonna actually, what good that's gonna serve that person in the long run to give them a lump sum of ten grand when they're just sitting on the floor begging. It's not gonna work that way. I'm not sure how much. I'm not sure about the, and the other opposite side. I'm not sure how beneficial it's gonna be to give, you know, workers to give them more money than maybe what they're worth. I don't know. It's just strange. It's a weird, 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 weird thing to be. Who who would be in charge, man? Being a boss is long, isn't it? Um, Amazon move comes after widespread strikes across uh, where workers across Europe. This summer, workers took action to coincide with internet retail giant's prime promotion event. Staffs at the World German and Spain and Poland were trying to force the firm to offer bare uh, working co conditions. Um, so yeah, so they figured it out. They got it all done. People are going to be paid a lot more. 10, 15, 10, 15 hours, a lot of money, man, in London to work for them. Um, uh, a lot of money, I, I guess, maybe in relation to um, the living costs in London overall. Maybe it's not that much, especially if you've maybe got a family. I guess it's not, but 10, 15 hours, fucking good working in a warehouse somewhere. Like, well done to everyone. Well done to those guys at Amazon for kind of recognizing the fuck up that they did. And for Jeff Bezos for digging deep into those billion dollar pockets and paying people. <laughs> What's next here? Oh, Yandy release. But it didn't release, did it? Because I read this ages ago. Yandy, um, Kanye West's album was meant to release, is has not released. Um, interesting, right? Um, this little video clip he put on social was fucking sick, though. This kind of hologram kind of thing. And it gets up on the screen. I'm sure you guys have seen it. It's all like a mini disc thing that's playing, right? That looks cool. Mm. Yeah. Oh, look at that. Mini disc, compact disc. Yeah, time to go. Well, not time to go. Correction, all right? Not time to go because Yandy isn't coming out. Uh, Kanye's been on a bit of a weird one lately, right? A little bit of a weird one. Hard to kind of figure out what's actually going on there. Um, I don't necessarily care, I don't think. Um, I think... Um, I'm in a I'm in a minority here when I say I generally don't give a fuck what some of these um, musicians or, or celebrities do in their private life or what they speak about um, outside of the artistry. I don't care for the most part. Um, I but I guess it's an interesting time for people in hip hop um, because now I think hip hop has finally got their own Morrissey. I think Kanye is the hip hop Morrissey, and if you're asking what does that mean? Um, if you're familiar, Morrissey is a, used to be a member of a band called The Smiths, right? And then when Morrissey left The Smiths and decided to venture off into his own solo career, he then started to do a lot more promotion, a lot more talking, and he has very questionable uh, political and societal points of views, um, which were very, 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 very divisive. But The Smiths is such a seminal 
uh, band. It's such an influential band for a lot of people, especially me included. You know, introduced me to skateboarding, introduced a lot of people maybe to um, sexuality, uh, to growing up, to maturity, to moving away. It's just one of those kind of like, it's kind of one of those seminal bands that kind of defines a lot of people's childhoods, a lot of people's teenage years, adult life, whatever it may be. So they have such a grip on people's lives that it really made people question um, how they viewed the Smiths Mor and, Morrissey's art and Morrissey's music um, by itself and the person himself. And I think now hip hop has to kind of struggle or wrestle with the idea of Kanye West has contributed so much to hip hop. He's contributed so many great music, so much great music, so many great cultural moments that now, you know, in his older age and how he's getting, you know, maybe a bit more politically aware, a bit more aware of what's happening in society, he's coming up, you know, he's, he's, his points of views are a little bit scattergun, they're a little bit confused, they're not very well thought out, they're very emotional, um, and they just, you know, they're, they don't hit the mark, right? They like kind of, you know, they're, they're always offbeat. You always have to kind of go back again, you know, they're kind of always offbeat, they're always, always offbeat. So people have to really, really think the you know, the really big uh, Kanye stands. They have to really mull over the idea of like, can you be a fan of somebody's art and still and, and not be a fan of the person themselves? And but me personally, I always subscribe to the idea of like, I don't care. I think I have so much stuff to figure out in my own life. I have so many things to kind of like sort out. Um, I'm such a mess myself that spending any amount of free um, available time trying to figure out why someone's saying this or getting worried or crying or getting upset or canceling somebody, that's just ridiculous. I'm not doing that. Um, but if I had to kind of like um, hypothesize from, you know, you know, kind of like um, sitting on the couch somewhere and kind of pointing fingers, I would just say, you know, I think you're kind of seeing the best and the worst of Kanye at the moment, right? This is just what he does, isn't it? Um, whenever he, whenever he, people say he can't do something, he's hell-bent on proving that he can do it. And I think for quite a lot of us creatives out there or people in the entertainment industry, I think, or even just people in general, I think it's been super inspiring to see him do that because it's allowed us to kind of like live our dreams through him in a weird way, all right? Or to gain inspiration or to kind of think, you know what, if Kanye could do it, I can do it too, right? He proved everyone wrong. He's No one could say he could be a producer. He did it. No one said he could have a fashion line. He did it. No one could say he could have a shootout, jump over the jump, man. He did it, right? He done all these things that prove people wrong and it kind of gives us inspiration and gives us hope too. But then on the other side of the coin, when he's, when he, um, because everything he's done has been so off the, off, he's been flying off the seat of his pants. He's so emotional. He's so off the hip. It's so off the cuff. Um, it's not very well thought out. But because he 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 scores, he kind of like hits the balls like so many times, um, just by luck. You know, he's the kind of dude that you know those guys that kind of throw the basketball over the back of their heads um, from behind from the back, right? Like not looking at the at the basketball rim. Um, because he's done that. Because he's done a swish with that ten times in a row. It's, it only makes sense that even though he's missed seventeen times since then. Because he's scored ten times, he's still gonna keep trying, right? He's not gonna he's not gonna stop throwing that ball, and I think that's what you're seeing with the whole MAGA cat thing. That's what you're seeing with the whole like backing Donald Trump. That's what you're seeing with the whole like slavery is a choice thing. That's what you're seeing with everything that he's doing is that he's he's hell bent on proving everyone wrong the same way he proved everyone wrong in the past. And obviously everyone's playing into the narrative. Everyone's kind of trying to, you know, argue argue him down, trying to convince him not to do these certain things, but. In his in his eyes, the more you're saying no, the more he he sees a road forward, right? Which is kind of counterintuitive for a lot of people, right? Because that goes against what everyone usually does. Because you know, people usually, if something's really painful or if something's getting them a lot of scrutiny, they usually back away. That's the kind of natural reaction that we have, right? You want to just back away. You don't want to have all the eyes on you. But you know, um, kind of said that in quite a lot of interviews. Like he wants all the smoke. He wants all. He wants everything because that kind of feeds into his kind of creative. Um, energies, right? He kind of likes that, and he's using the term energy a lot, right? Changing the energy of the MAGA cap and all that sort of stuff, right? He, that was what he needs, and I think people aren't realizing that the more that they're talking about it, the, the more that they're getting upset about it, the more that it's kind of just putting, he's kind of making him solidifying his point of view. He's doubling down, sort of thing, right? He's kind of adopting that kind of conservative um, uh, rationale, a conservative point of view, where the more you shout at a conservative pundit or think or kind of like spokesperson or um representative 
from their position because they you know they kind of have a partisan blunt shit they're just backing somebody because you know they wear a red tie the more you try and shut them down the more they just kind of like knuckle in deep and say nope i'm not moving i'm not budging just, like just to spite you kind of thing and i, I don't now i don't think Kanye's trying to spite his fans but i just think he's trying to prove everyone wrong like no trust me you're gonna thank me 10 years later you're gonna thank me five years yeah that kind of thing um whether or not it works or not i don't know i think um I, there there's no risk to just sit back and just watch the show I don't think we need to counsel anyone or kind of get get anyone out and say, oh yeah, Kanye's over. Stop listening to his music. I think that's ridiculous. Um, I still think it's one of the greatest minds that we have in music right right about now. Instrumentation, um, just the, and just the idea of just the, even even if you didn't like the albums that came out of the whole Wyoming project, I think just the idea that someone of his level can do that, right? Can take that risk to kind of like you know take his whole entire family to uh, Wyoming. Um, and kind of turn Wyoming into a now a new kind of cultural uh, hotspot, maybe. Um, the idea of kind of like uh, unplugging from social media or from kind of like outside stimuli and creating a, a bit of a, a bit of a bit of work or a body of work in a short period of time, and then putting that out to the public. The idea that the the, the cover image was taken on the iPhone and that kind of edited there on the spot. I think there's something to be really admired about that. Somebody on that level. Now, don't get me wrong. He's he's a bit crazy. And he does things. You know, of the seat of his pants anyway. But I think somebody of that level of star power, doing things so punk, so DIY, um, so grassroots like that is really inspiring. I think that should be something that should be lauded. I think his instrumentation, the way he kind of used sounds and layers and shit, is something that's you know should be credited. So we shouldn't cancel the dude, but I think just let it play out. Let's see what happens. But also, I think you know, investing too much time into psychoanalyzing someone that you don't know, I think is really weird. I think caring that much or or putting that much weight into i think even just in gen, just just in short like really caring about what kanye has to say about politics or about uh, problems in society it's kind of nuts right you should be looking for other voices like you should have different voices for different things in the same in the same fashion how you have different friends for different occasions right you might have a couple of friends that you go out to get fucked up with you might have a friend that you like to go shopping with you might have a friend that you prefer to hang out with you and your mum. You might have a friend that is a better person, um, you know, when it comes to recommending clothing choices. I don't know, whatever. You might have a friend that you like to go on holiday and a friend that you don't like to go on holiday with. You should have different sources of information or different people that you go to when you want to um, have, um, when, you, when you want an informed opinion on things, right? And you shouldn't be going to Kanye West for your political or societal POVs. I don't think so, personally. Um, it's, he's not nece- he's not informed and he doesn't necessarily um, say he is he always saying like at the moment that he's going with his heart he's not reading anything um, he's taking um, long pauses and trying to figure out stuff on the spot not because he's trying to think through an answer but because he hasn't really thought about an answer um, he has he doesn't he doesn't necessarily read right um, uh, or he doesn't read a, enough around the subject, right? He's just taking like short articles and blurbs or regurgitating things he might have heard within his friendship group who kind of heard it from another person too. And again, it's just not, that's not slight. It's just to say that, you know, you shouldn't be, you shouldn't be, um, you shouldn't be putting that much value into that person's point of view when they haven't thought through their own point of view themselves. I don't think that if they, if they, if they can't take the time out of the day, um, if they can't take the time out to kind of, you know, sit down and study what they have to say, then why should you think, why should you sit down and listen to what they have to say as well? I don't think that makes any sense whatsoever. So I think people just need to take a step back, relax, um, let him kind of fumble through what he has to say, what he has to figure out and see how it plays out. He might be right. He might be wrong. Who knows? But I'm not canceling the dude. If the album comes out and it's great, I'll be playing it on loop. Um, again, I said Kanye is hip hop's Morrissey. Can you, that's the question you got to ask yourself, can you separate the man from the music? And if you can, take a, take a break. If you can't, now I think you have to maybe question, um, question how much um, credence, how much value you put into what your musicians or what your entertainers say and what they do or what they make and stuff. Like you have to kind of, it's a little bit nuts, I think, sometimes. I think we're all fallible to um, really dumb point of views or saying really stupid things. I don't think that should be held against us in that regard. So, yeah, let's see what Yandy sounds like. I'm interested to see what it sounds like. Um, I'm sure by the time it comes out, and that's due to come out, I think, on Black Friday. So, on November 23rd, I think, or something like that. So, I'm assuming all this artwork that we're seeing now is probably going to be completely different to what was going to come out. He's, he's always, 
He's always changing things. Might be a different approach. Um, but I'm interested to see what it sounds like. I'm, I'm really am. I was one of the rare people that actually liked Yeezy. Um, so, I mean, Yeezy. So maybe it, it could be, you know, judging by the kind of cover with the whole CD-ROM shit, maybe it could be something similar. Um, you never know. Um, but I'd like to hear what it sounds like sonically. I'm interested to see where, where he kind of pushes things um, and how he kind of... Because his, his features are always interesting too. Even Lil Pump. Um, that feature you got him on, like he sounds really good on that track. You know what I mean? Like you say what you like about the track, say what you like about the video, but Lil Pump sounds good. He's got a knack. Kanye's got a knack for bringing the best out of these kind of like SoundCloud underground kind of rappers and kind of you know polishing them up a bit. You know, so let's see what it sounds like when it comes out. But like I said, everyone needs to take a breather, man, and relax. What's next? Um, IG founders step down. Big news in startup land. The founders or the original founders of, of Instagram have stepped down from their role because, um, you know, it, as you as you I'm sure most of you are aware, Facebook bought Instagram a, a few couple of years ago. For I think one billion or something like that. And then obviously when when companies like Facebook buy an Instagram, they kind of bring it in house. And the whole idea behind it is to kind of like um, have Instagram underneath their umbrella and then you can kind of tap into Instagram's um, talent pool. That's usually why they buy they buy um, apps. They usually buy the apps. Sometimes they'll buy the app even if it's not that good, just be, just to get to the founder and to get or to get to their um, developers or to get to the designers, whoever's the kind of standout people in their team, just so they can kind of like poach them away from the company all in one fell swoop. Because I'm assuming it's quite difficult to get a whole marketing team, a whole designer, um, whole developers into your company and absorb them in. We've seen the trouble that Adidas have had with the ex Nike guys that they kind of hired, those free dudes they got them together. I think they had to pay some sort of nominal fine or whatever. So it's quite hard to do that. So the kind of cheat way to do it is to kind of absorb a company even if you don't rate the app itself but if you do rate the app or if the app is fucking incredible like instagram is then you get you know you kill two birds one stone you get a great app and you get great talent so they got it but in overall you know with the introduction of facebook stories and facebook chat is kind of getting ramped up and the marketplace and shit you can kind of see that facebook and amazon are kind of bleeding into each other they're not necessarily in separate kind of places on the whole spectrum so it only made sense that over a period of time it would get to a point where the instagram founders or facebook themselves have had to kind of re reassess where they stood in the deal and kind of think about where they went to go forward but unfortunately for the instagram guys they kind of had to decide to take a step back and go elsewhere and it seems like because um the instagram the facebook people were just kind of getting a bit too involved with the whole situation so there's an article here i'm going to read from the verge um that kind of details a little bit of the story so it says instagram's co-founders have resigned from facebook um instagram co-founders kevin sistrom and mike krieger resigned from the photo sharing company today the news was first reported in the new york times and confirmed by a book close from Sistrum, sources speaking to Bloomberg say Sistrum and Kygo were frustrated by the uptick in Facebook Mark Zuckerberg's meddling as Facebook became increasingly reliant on Instagram for its future. Um, and in his blog post, he said, the one of the founders of Instagram said, um, we're planning on taking some time off to explore our curiosity and creativity again. Building new things requires that we take a step back, understand what inspires us and match that with what the world needs that's what we plan to do which is amazing so i'm looking forward to what they do next that's gonna be quite cool right the people that made instagram are going off into the sunset with their millions in their pockets and gonna take some time out meditate reflect on what they have and what they have what they've done and kind of you know try and see where they can go next which should be super super interesting to see um value that many times value that many times the one million one uh, that the one billion that mark uh, zuckerberg um agreed to purchase for and now counting more than 1 billion world users instagram is arguably facebook's most successful acquisition its growth since 2012 is largely a product of system and, Ke and kevin's vision the duo strategic use of facebook resources and a willingness to aggressively compete with snapchat mike and i are grateful for the last eight years of facebook team we've grown for 13 people to over a thousand with offices around the world and while building products that we use and love by the community of 1 billion which is amazing the 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 uh, now system and, and kids I, etic, um now systems and kaigas exit may impact the social network's ability to manage its ongoing crisis around electronic election re interference fake news and the general public perception that facebook is no longer healthy for society or democracy instagram is in position as a fast growing and successful term to facebook for teenage users and those disillusioned with facebook privacy violations and its larger impact on digital life without system and craig at the helm instagram has struggled to continue growing at its previous pace while also maintaining independence from facebook juggernaut which is very true 
A sist- um, Kevin sist- Sistern represented the second pair of widely accessible co-founders to sell a company to Facebook for billions and then depart some years later. Earlier this year, WhatsApp co-founder Jay Kuhn announced he was leaving Facebook over an apparent disagreement over privacy and data sharing. Kuhn's fellow co-founder left Facebook in 2017 and Acton was voiced not so subtle criticism of his former employer on Twitter though his investment of encrypted company signal. So it goes to show, okay, so, sist- so I guess they weren't the only dudes, right? So the founders of WhatsApp too, they left as well. So, um, it's again, it's just meddling, right? So, it's it's hard, I guess. When a company does acquire you and you get absorbed, I guess if you're Mark Zuckerberg too, and you get this amazing, talented group of people come in who are kind of giving your um, office a bit of new energy, you're kind of getting these fresh ideas coming in, it does reach a point where you kind of also want to, you know, you kind of feel like you need to kind of, you know, dip your dick into the sauce. And it can get, I guess it can be annoying if you're the Instagram founder, but... Man, oh man, it happens quite often. This sort of thing, isn't it? Like they acquire a they acquire a company and then they just end up just fucking it up just because they want to get involved. They 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 want to they want to they want to have their voice as well heard within these meetings. That's something that can get a little bit annoying. There's stories and rumors going around that supposedly one of the things that kind of set the Instagram founders off edge or kind of got them really pissed off was that um, on Instagram when you share a photo from Instagram to Facebook. Um, and you check it on Facebook, it shows that the, it, it, there's a little like um, a little footer note that says, oh, this image has been uploaded from Instagram. But recently, Instagram, uh, Facebook kind of uh, disabled that visibility thing, so you can't necessarily see it. Um, so it just looks like something was uploaded into, onto Facebook when actually it came from Instagram to Facebook. And that's something that kind of got on their nerves. And just in general, um, Facebook are going quite hard with the whole Facebook stories thing, which looks fucking terrible. I would never in a million years upload anything onto Facebook stories. Never happening. Um, so that's interesting to see. And yeah, just overall, man, um, it's interesting to see where they're going to go. Because again, like this article mentioned, Facebook doesn't have a great representation, great uh, reputation or, um, or public perception when it comes to privacy and data. So it's going to be interesting to see how they kind of remain cool while still being under the banner of Facebook. But I guess while still being more of a Facebook company. But I guess for the most part, your average, your, your everyday user that uses Instagram probably has no idea about this sort of like inside baseball um, kind of like stuff that's happening within startup land, right? They probably have no idea who even the founder of Instagram is. They probably couldn't pick them up from a lineup. So I guess they'd have no idea about the founders leaving and it being acquired by Facebook. They probably have no clue whatsoever. So they won't even notice the change. Um, but let's see what happens in the next few um, months happening. I think they, they already appointed somebody from Facebook to kind of head up Instagram. I think there was a partnership dude or something like that. So they're already kind of going forward. But again, like I said, I'm interested to see what the what those two guys from Instagram actually do next. What, the, what their next idea for their app is going to be. Um, anyway, what else comes here next? Desperate times call for desperate measures. What's this? Bada bing, bada boom. Uh, oh, Dublin Airport plane. Co- oh, Jesus Christ. Yeah, this is a fucking amazing, amazing article. So I saw this, um, I think just before I left to go to Berlin, actually, I thought this was quite funny. Um, supposedly, somebody at the Dublin Airport was late um, in getting their plane. You know, when the whole, you know, you're, you, you you get told many, many a times, right, when you book a ticket to go to an airport that, you know, you should try and get there four hours in advance, right? Just to, you know, accommodate for any kind of delays, just in case the flight is delayed or cancelled, so you have enough time to kind of schedule another flight, right? That's kind of, that's why they tell you four hours, right? And also, maybe immigration might be crazy, crazy long queue. Because I remember, I remember seeing a picture, if you've ever been to Stansted Airport before, I remember seeing a picture, I think during the, the height of summer, maybe in July or June, um... I saw a picture of the immigration queue that was, and it snaked out all the way into the front of the, the kind of like, you know, of the doors of Stansted. You know, when you come through Stansted, you kind of got all the like shops and shit and you got the, the place where you check in your luggage. I saw uh, a queue going from the immigration bit, which is like on the far left, right? All the way until there. So it was, it snaked all the way through where the immigration bit is, past all the check-in points for all the different airlines and then all the way to the front of it. That's why I saw the queue. I was like, Jesus Christ. So that's why people, that's why airlines say you should get the four hours in advance just in case you you happen you to be unlucky enough to book your holiday during a real peak, peak time. And then sometimes as well, just in case your flight gets cancelled. But there's always that person or there's always those people that go to the airport. I don't know why. I don't know if it's because they're frequent flyers and they know that most of the time, you know, it's quite rare for flights to get cancelled, right? They do get delayed, but they don't actually get cancelled completely. It doesn't happen that often. Um, I think it's happened to me maybe maybe once in my whole entire life of flying, right? Um, 
Now, again, I haven't flown as many times as other people, but I've flown quite often, and it's only happened to me once. So I guess maybe those people might think that, you know, your flight never gets cancelled, usually gets delayed. So they would leave it to last, last minute. My only um, counter to it is that whenever I'm going on holiday, it's either a day I booked off free, or it's a day that I'm trying to get the most out of my holiday. Like, I don't know. I'm trying to leave after work, or whatever it may be. Or I've worked from home, I've worked half a day. It's, it's rare that I'm like at home and trying to just rest at home and chill. I want to go to my destination. So if I, if I can get an hour ahead, I don't mind because I'm excited to go, right? So it's not, it's like, I don't necessarily get people that want to just like squeeze as much time as they can at home and get to the airport just on time. It makes no sense because you're going to wait regardless. You're going to wait in immigration. You're going to wait to get on the plane. You're going to wait uh, to get your luggage on there. You're going to wait for the plane to take off. You're going to wait when the train taxis. You're going to wait when the train, when the plane lifts off. You're, every point in that air journey, you're waiting. There's not a point, you, you don't just go into a plane and it just takes off. It's always a wait. There's always the kind of a, del a delay that happens. So I don't necessarily get the whole like staying at home and then getting to the airport just when your plane's about to leave. And it's, it's a fucking annoying. It's super annoying, man. Like, God damn. Grown adults running down the immigration line. Oh, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. I've got to lift my plane. It's like, so? Every time that happens to me, I, w I, move, the, I move so, I know it's, it's horrible to do, but I move so slowly. I just, I moved as slow as I can. Like, okay, there you go. Just to slow them down a bit, to kind of get them more exasperated. And you hear them go, oh, oh man, oh man. It's like, dude, trust me. I'm not the one making you late. I guarantee you, me, Agostino, is not the person that's making you late to go to your plane. It, you left your house, um, I don't know, an hour ago, 45 minutes ago, and your plane's going to leave in 15 minutes. You made yourself late, not me. Trust me, I'm not the one to make you late. And the airport somehow has to accommodate for these people. It's just annoying. I don't even... Sometimes they have to accommodate for them because you see the, some a staff from the airport will kind of chaperone the person through, um, guide them through the kind of turnstiles, pass the queue, and maybe get them through on another side of it. It's like, why are they getting preferential treatment because they're late? Why don't we all do that? Why can't we all, why can't we all wake up late, right? Wait at home, right? Watch TV, um, have a sandwich, um, have a shit, whatever it may be, and then come late. Why can't we all do that? Because we're grown-ups, that's why. Because we're grown-ups. So this, this absolute plunker, right, in Dublin Airport decides to do the same thing with disastrous consequences, right? Disastrous story. So I'll put this story up here and read it to you. Um, Dublin Airport plane chasing passenger charged, right? Plane chasing. Not even fucking gate chasing, plane chasing. A passenger has been pinned to the ground... Uh, by police in Dublin airport after running out onto the terminal towards a plane shouting at the pilot to wait how he even got to the fucking ground I don't know right Patrick Keogh 23 made it to the taxiing um, Ryanair aircraft before police arrested him at 7 o'clock in the morning which is oh, actually I, I, I take that back whenever I've been on a Ryanair flight especially the one I just got on this time in Berlin usually Ryanair budget airlines you, you don't have that thing they don't they don't let you walk through that uh, tube thing you know that kind of like thing where you, when you're in the airport I'm not sure what it's called. That kind of like tunnel from that you know, from the checking gate all the way to the aircraft. They don't usually you usually walk on walk on a tarmac. You know, it's a budget airline, so they usually walk you on a tarmac and you just walk onto a plane. So I'm assuming the 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 kind of ticket person was still there. So uh, Patrick Keogh, 23, made it to a taxi in Ryanair aircraft before police arrested him at seven o'clock in the morning. He has been charged with criminal damage at the door lock and granted bail. A ground crew member said he just ran from the building towards the plane, which is departing for Amsterdam. Like, imagine, 23 years old, he's got books to fly to Amsterdam. It probably cost him an arm and leg to get there, right? He probably didn't have any other money. Like, oh, got it for the lad. Um, <laughs> the Irish man was quite determined to make his flight. An eyewitness told the Irish broadcast RTE, um, adding that he was ran towards the plane with his, with his suitcase under his arm. What an absolute muppet, right? Uh... Uh, BBC News, um, Duncan Harvey, uh, Duncan Harvey, who was at the scene, said that when the police arrived, there was a scuffle and Mr. Keogh was pinned to the tarmac. That's him there, right, Mr. Keogh? Look him. Patrick Keogh shouted abuse waiting, uh, as waiting journalists as they appeared in court. Of course he did. Am I surprised? No. The guy who ran towards the train, uh, ran towards the fucking aeroplane, trying to bang its doors, right? I don't know how he jumped up that high or whatever he did, right? He tried to bang on the aeroplane to get it to stop like it's a fucking... 26 bus right is waving is shining abuse that fucking waiting journalist i am not surprised um mr keo of what that what kind of village is that in, in fucking um island what rahinik rahinas kiga 
Jesus Christ, Gory in County Wexford was brought before Dublin's district court later on on Thursday morning. There were no objections to the bail and Kia was released on his own bond of £178. He is to appear again on the 8th of November. Mr. Kia covered his face with a folder and shouted abuse at waiting journalists as he left the court before swinging his suitcase at the crowd, lowering his trousers to expose his backside. Ah, Mr. Kia was a fucking legend. He used, to, he used to go on Big Brother. He used to go and fucking separate Big Brother, dude. Imagine you're in the wrong, dude. You, you're wrong. Imagine him being pissed off that this journalist at Wayne that's on the court because he decided to run onto the tarmac and try and shout a plane down, right? And he's give he's fucking doing moonies to the to the journalist, the the brass, the guts on this dude, the guts on this guy. Jesus Christ! Um, the flight departed 21 minutes behind schedule, but reportedly landed on time in Amsterdam. In a statement, an airport spokesman said. A male and female passenger were late for a Ryanair flight to Amsterdam this morning and arrived at the boarding gate after the flight was closed. Uh, they were engaging with Ryanair staff at the gate and the male passenger was becoming agitated. He was banging on the window to try and get the aircraft to wait and made his way onto the uh, apron trying to flag the aircraft down. <laughs> Imagine trying to signal the plane. Signal the plane. Signal the plane that's just taking love. This fucking guy is a nutcase. The male addition restrained by a Ryanair staff on the apron before air police arrived to the scene and tackled him to the ground and arrested him. This guy's a fucking nutcase, man. Mr. Keo, Mr. Patrick Keo needs to go on Big Brother. He needs to go on Big Brother so badly, man. This guy's an absolute nutcase. I'm, sh I'm assuming he's, um, the female was probably his girlfriend, right? Um, yeah, it's funny because I've got an interesting story, actually. I remember once I, when, I went to, when I was meant to go to Barcelona to run a half marathon, but I, I missed my flight. The only flight I've missed in my life, right? And that was, again, my fault, right? Um... They tell you to get to the airport four hours ahead of time. I think I tried to get to the airport an hour ahead of hour and a half ahead of time, but then I but then I missed my coach, so which meant I was gonna get late. So I, I would have been just on time if I left an hour and a half, but because I missed my coach, I got there late. Um, I got there too late, right? Um, which is again totally my fault. Um, the coach, I, no, actually I didn't miss my coach. My coach just took long. It was just like a slow driver. He was in loads of traffic, just like taking the piss uh, driving-wise. I think maybe because he was maybe trying to get back on time with the timetable and shit. I don't know. So I, I, it just took really long to get there. So when I, by the time I got there, the gate just closed, right? So I missed my flight. And then I remember there was a couple in front of me, um, and this girl was bawling her eyes out. I think they missed the flight too, right? And there was like a, another dude that was there, uh, obviously her boyfriend, I'm assuming, right? And he kind of had like a real like stony, like ghostly face on And you can tell just looking from at them and their relationship and how they were arguing, you could tell that, you know, usually girls are more worried about time for the most part, about being early, being on time, and you know, that kind of stuff and more parochial about that sort of stuff. Guys can be a little bit, you know, a little bit uh, Bob Marley about it, a little bit laid back. And I know I am. I can be sometimes a bit like that, right? So you could tell that he was the one that was like, no, nah, don't worry, babe. We're gonna, we have loads of time. We've got loads of time. And she was the one that, no, dude, we need to go. We need to go. We need to go. And obviously she kind of like curtailed, you know, she kind of thought maybe, you know, we're going on a holiday. Let me not be an annoying bitch. Let me just chill out. Let me like relax. He's always saying I'm too, uh, I'm too uptight. And for once she decided not to be uptight about it and look what happened. And then when they got to the airport, it was late and she was right. And they missed their fucking flight to go to Barcelona. And of course, I think this was peak time. This is February or whatever it may have been. And I think it was one of those flights on a Saturday or something where it's the only flight of the day and your next flight is the next day and the other one was full. So it was just absolute shit show and she was bawling her eyes out like 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 grief crying. It was so sad, man. I felt so bad for the guys. But again, it's your own fault. My fault, their fault, Patrick Keogh's fault. It's your own fault. You can't then decide to run onto the tarmac and start shouting obscenities at the plane or at the pilot or at the flipping uh, check-in staff. It's insane. That's why I love watching um, um, Lost in the Airport, all that kind of, you know, those airport programs where people miss their flights and stuff because it's like the entitlement some people have with airplanes is nuts. Like they get there late and they still think that the airplane has to or the airline ha has to accommodate their lateness. If the whole entire plane is here on time, that means you're late. It doesn't mean anyone else is late. It means that you're late. And all the tickets, again, I don't know if maybe tickets need to say, because sometimes when you get an airline ticket, it would say the time the flight is leaving and also say the time the gate is closing, right? So that can kind of give you an idea of when you need to get there. But I think there needs to be maybe an option on the tickets to say minimum time for arrival at the airport. You have to be that this time to guarantee your kind of, to guarantee you get on the plane should be a set time, right? It has to be that thing. They have to do that thing for some people because some people can be a bit dim with it. But then I also remember on the flip side of it, um, going to, where'd I go to? Oh, when I went to Barcelona 
for Pima Vera, well, when I met my friends the second time, I remember, think, I remember because the fucking budget airlines are like this, right? They have a really short window from the time the gate is announced to the time the gate is quote unquote closed. So I remember I got to the airport, you know, with plenty of time. I was walking around, I was buying a drink, I was having breakfast, so I was losing my phone. And the, the, the number didn't appear. Just so when you looked up on the departure thing, it'd say, oh, gate will, uh, gate, um, the gate will appear at a set time. Let's say half an hour from whenever I was, I was sitting down. So I thought, okay, whatever, let me go and have a shit, you know, have a drink, eat something and relax. So I was doing it relaxing and then, uh, I don't know, time elapsed. So it, it was like 40 minutes had gone by. It wasn't exactly for half an hour and I forgot. I looked up again and it said gate closed. And I was like, fuck off. I got so panicky. I was like, no, I've been here. No way. This, this, this is ridiculous. No way. So imagine I was I was on time the whole time, right, in the airport, r- relaxing, waiting. I looked, at the, I looked at the departure board. My gate hadn't been announced yet. And it said it would be announced in half an hour. I then waited, but then I didn't check in half an hour. I checked in 40 minutes and then it said the gate was closed. So I started panicking. I got all my shit and started running. And if you know, you know, running with a backpack and your luggage is horrible. Running in the airport with shit in your pockets and a backpack and your luggage is fucking worse. So I'm running in the airport and the airport thing is just so many straight lines, right? Oh, loads of right angles. You're just fucking going, oh, you're going up, right, up, left, 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 continually. And then I finally, finally get to my gate. And guess what happens when I get to my gate? The it's packed. It's a massive queue. No, no, no one's even boarded yet. It's just a huge queue. And I get there, and I'm the only. And I get there, and I'm like, they all see me because I think they probably hear my fucking elephant feet from I don't know, hundred meters away. And I'm like, <gasps> panting and covered in sweat, absolutely covered in sweat. So, 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 so embarrassing. So that's the other side of it. Do you know what I mean? Where you're in the airport. You check your gate one minute, you check it again, it says the gate is closed, and it's like, fuck you, you run, and you get there covered in sweat, and there's a massive queue at your gate anyway. But in that res- in that kind of instance, even if the gate did close, I could have a reason to kind of like object to it, because, you know, I'm sure they could tell from the time that I scanned in my boarding pass, my kind of like scan time, they could tell that I, I was there like two and a half hours before before the uh, gate was even closed, so the, um, the gate was even announced. So the fact that they would not allow me to play, would, I don't think that was possible. I think they would they would kind of make an allowance in that regard. 100%, they have to anyway. Come on, man. I'd, maybe, yeah, because I guess, you know when you're in an airplane and they announce someone's name and say, oh, it's Mr. So-and-so on the plane? Um, or no, when they announce in the airport, uh, your flight's about to depart. Blah, blah, blah. I'm, I'm assuming it's because you've, you've, you've uh, checked in or you've kind of scanned your boarding pass uh, at immigration early ahead of time so you weren't late so they know that you're somewhere in the airport maybe you're having a shit maybe you fainted in the toilet i don't know wherever it may be but jesus christ man this patrick dude's a fucking nutcase imagine running imagine running running onto the tarmac of an airplane and trying to bang the doors down so they can get to open it like what huh how are they gonna even let you in maybe because it was ta- it's still in taxi so the, the the ladder was still there and shit but what's he gonna do jump on the fucking wheels and and kind of hoist himself up into the latch when it goes in like absolute nutcase but that kind of desperation usually comes because you know people don't have enough money they usually just book a holiday and then they spend all of it which i've i've not which i don't do anymore i save money and then go on holiday and then you could have and if 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 some emergency thing does happen or you need you know you need to kind of book a like that like this berlin trip you need to book a, uh, a cab to go to the airport you can do it but that whole like just booking your holiday and only having the money for the holiday is not a good idea just save up and then you even if you do miss your flight you can just book another one like it's no big deal um but yeah absolute nutcase man absolute fucking nutcase i saw a story and i was like this guy is crazy what else um i think that might be it you know that's one hour isn't it yeah that's an hour that's an hour we got an hour we done it we done it episode 111 of the excellent zinger show thank you so much for tuning in 111 triple one double double or whatever the one is so i've been your host agostino thanks so much for tuning in it's been a pleasure to speak to you guys as always i'll be back again hopefully tomorrow if not sunday um of course, I'm DJing this Friday or tonight at the at Tap East in Westfield Shafford. So if you're in the area, come down, hear me play some tunes, have a beer or two. And then or, and then um, the rest of the dates, you can find them on my website. That's excellentzingo.com. Uh, click on DJ gigs and all my listings are going to be on there. Um, support me on Patreon if you can. And also support my podcast sponsor, which is audible.com for just Aggie. That's audible.com for just Aggie to claim one free book credit as well as a 30 day free trial. All the links can be found below. This has been the Agostino Zinger Show, episode number 111. Thanks so much for tuning in, and I'll see you guys again next time. Peace.